Hey, welcome back. And so we are talking about some chemistry of water, and uh, we're going to start looking at the uh, the importance of water and how the structure of water and its ability to form hydrogen bonds uh, leads to some interesting biological um, applications. If you like to think about it like that. So, why is water uh, so important? Why is it have unusual properties, and how do they relate to biology? So, it's the third part of this uh, this sequence. Okay, so we were talking about uh, hydrogen bonding. Remember, hydrogen bonding between water molecules occurs because of the slightly negative charge on the oxygen atom of one water molecule being attracted to the slightly positive um, charge on the hydrogen um, atom of an adjacent water molecule. And this gives us networks of hydrogen bonds which are highly unstable and in the liquid form constantly breaking and forming and breaking and forming. If we drop the temperature in the water down, those hydrogen bonds stabilize. And, um, and and we get crystalline water. And so uh, where does that lead us to? Um, it leads us to an interesting observation about water, which you already know, I don't need to, to really tell you this, but it's a good place to start talking about this. Um, liquid water is more dense than solid water. Um, now you know this because if you take uh, ice cubes and you put them in in in, uh, in a soda or something like that, um, some water, liquid water. If you put solid water and liquid water, the ice cubes float. This tells us that the liquid water is more dense than the solid water. Ice floats, blindingly obvious. You know this. So how do we explain that phenomenon and what's it got to do with biology? So let's do the explanation and then the biology next. Okay. So uh, why is um, liquid water more dense than solid water? Why does ice float? Um, so think back to those hydrogen bonds. Uh, one water molecule can make up to four hydrogen bonds with its neighbors. So um, when uh, the temperature in water drops, and what is happening is that the hydrogen bonds stabilize and and all four of those hydrogen bonds um, are forming. And so all the adjacent water molecules get pushed away um, the distance of the hydrogen bonds. So all the water molecules get pushed away from one another the distance of the hydrogen bond. And so that causes the water to, to kind of expand. It's the same amount of matter, but it's occupying a greater volume. And so that means its density has dropped. Um, and so that means that it will it will be less dense than in liquid water because in liquid water remember the hydrogen bonds are forming and breaking and forming and breaking and so the water molecules can get closer together and in the solid water in the ice all the water molecules are pushed the same distance apart and so we get this expanded lattice but in the liquid water the water molecules can bump into one another the hydrogen bonds are breaking and forming and breaking and forming so only a few hydrogen bonds uh, being present we're going to push all the water molecules away from one another otherwise they can get close together and so there we've got the same amount of stuff in a small volume and density goes up so the ice floats and the liquid water um, effectively sinks under the ice if you want to think about it like that so what's that got to do with biology um, uh, Let's think about the origins of life on Earth to start with. Now, let's imagine that the oceans uh, weren't made of um, weren't made of uh, of water. They were made of something else. They were made of some other substance, which, uh, when it froze, became um, more dense as a solid than as a liquid. Um, that means that that material would sink, and then the oceans would freeze from the bottom up, and so is what we would have is as temperature fluctuated uh, we would have this freezing of the oceans from the bottom to the top rather than ice forming on the top and because we we, we, we accept the idea that that um, life probably originated in the oceans you can't have life originating in solid ice it had to have it had to appear and then undergo its early uh, chemical and then biological evolution um, in a liquid um, in, in, in water and so you can't create life and you can't evolve early life in solid masses of ice and that's what you would get if solid water was more dense than liquid water it would sink and then oceans would freeze from the bottom up so the fact that ice floats on water on liquid water has got some interesting implications for considering um, the origins of life and the early evolution of life in oceans uh, what else well if you think about what happens in the winter um, in the winter kind of where we are in Colorado is what's going to happen is the ice will form and it will form at the top of a lake or a pond or something like that and the water below the ice will be in liquid form and so fish invertebrates plants things like that can survive below 
the ice. And now if the ice sank and froze up, all the life in that lake would, or pond would, would die every winter. Um, uh, and again, that's not stable. And so that's not conducive to um, the early evolution and then diversification of life that we see. Um, the other thing as well is that the, the ice that forms on the top of the water is actually insulating some of the, uh, some of the water below. And so that water is obviously it's in a liquid state and it's not freezing. That means it's got a higher temperature and that's going to be more conducive to, to life kind of overwintering, if you like. So that's kind of an interesting um, aspect of water that comes purely from water being polar, water forming hydrogen bonds, and that's connected back to the to the appearance of life on Earth and then the early evolution and diversification of life. Um, the second interesting property of water that arises out of its hydrogen bonding is that it has a high specific heat. So what does this mean? Um, is what this means is that um, water takes will absorb a lot of energy before it changes temperature and we're going to talk a little bit about this later when we talk about um, uh, patterns of, of, of climate and, and, and stability of different environments on the planet um, but let's talk about the kind of what's going on here on the slide I've got a kilogram of gold a kilogram of aluminium and a kilogram of water so let's say we want to raise each of these kilograms of substance by 10 degrees Celsius I've got to put more energy in a kilogram of water, that's a liter, a kilogram of water to get it to go up the 10 degrees Celsius than I do have to put into the kilogram of aluminium and then the kilogram of gold. And so things like, um, things like think, think about it like this, if you go in and, you, and, you, and you put an iron or a steel or a pan, a cast iron pan on your stove and you fill it up with water, um, wh which one heats up? First, um, bearing in mind one's obviously not in direct contact with the heat, and one is. But you know, taking that and putting it aside, which of those warms up first? If you put a stove with water on a pan, stove, uh, put a pan of water on your stove. Sorry, um, which warms up first? Well, the pan warms up first because it's made of iron or something like that. Um, it's got a lower specific heat. That means that um, it will raise its temperature quicker for every every joule or calorie of energy that we put into it compared to water so that's a that's again is due to hydrogen bonding in water so it's what happens is is when you put energy into water uh, rather than the molecules kinetic energy going up which is an increase in temperature um, is what happens is that the, the, the think about the the hydrogen bonds absorbing that energy and then the hydrogen bonds break so the first thing that happens in water when you heat it up is the hydrogen bonds break and you get more kinetic energy and you keep heating you keep heating more hydrogen bonds in the water break and eventually you get an increased rate of evaporation and you get transition to the vapor state so um, you can't you don't have that in aluminium or gold because there's no hydrogen bonding in those in those in those substances and so when you put energy into aluminium or gold the kinetic energy of the molecules goes up there's no hydrogen bonds to be broken so there's an important kind of sub message here which is actually really important and that is when you put heat energy into water you break the hydrogen bonds so the important message here is not just about specific heat but that when you put energy into a bond the bond breaks and that means that if the bond forms, energy comes out. Now, you, you probably see in, in, in kind of high school biology classes, these, these kind of ATP molecules that flash as though when they get broken down, there's this release of energy. And, and that's actually wrong. That's not how the chemistry works. And we're going to come back to that and talk about that uh, a little bit later when we talk about some thermodynamics. So what is the application of water having this high specific heat? Um, well, the first one, the first thing I could I could talk about here is um, is evaporative cooling. Yeah, you and I sweat, and other animals, certain other animals sweat, and, and that's a, a mechanism for keeping us cool when the temperature goes up. So what's happening there? Well, the temperature goes up, and your body has a bunch of sensory neurons which sense the increase in temperature um, on your skin, and and they they cause sweat glands to release sweat. And sweat is largely water, and there's a lot of salts and things in there as well. And you have to replace those if you're doing any athletics and you're sweating heavily. Um, but the water that's released onto the surface of your skin, um, the heat energy from your skin enters the water, and what's the first thing that happens? The hydrogen bonds break between the water molecules. You put that heat energy in from the skin, the heat is leaving your body. It is entering the water 
breaking the hydrogen bonds the hydrogen and then the water molecules kinetic energy has gone up and then you get evaporation from the surface so the kinetic energy that is taken away in the water molecules when when you're when you're evaporatively cooling when you're when you're sweating um, that kinetic energy is the transfer of heat from your skin to the water molecules which vibrate faster the hydrogen bonds break and then the water evaporates and as it evaporates the water's got a higher kinetic energy than it started with and that means that you're basically losing heat energy so this is important biologically because this is a form of homeostasis this is one of the unifying principles remember we started off with those kind of list of unifying principles and we came down to uh, we came down to evolution as a really important unifying principle homeostasis is an is, a, is a also a very important unifying principle um, so this is where um, organisms um, we're talking all the way from single cell bacteria up to complex animals like humans. This is where they maintain a steady, stable internal state. Now, what I don't want you to take away from this is that homeostasis is equilibrium. Okay, this is equilibrium. Two things in balance. They are equal. They're balanced. Homeostasis is not about that. Homeostasis is the maintain maintenance of a steady, stable state. So, for example, if we keep this state steady, that's homeostasis. For example, um, I'm sitting in my office at home and it's actually, I've got the temperature, I've got the, got the heat cranked right down and it's the middle of winter uh, and it's about 63 degrees in my, in my house right now. But my body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. My body is working to, to create heat energy and, and that's keeping me at a steady, stable state of 37 degrees Celsius. My environment is at 63 Fahrenheit, whatever that is in Celsius, probably about 19, I'd imagine. Um, so here's my house temperature here's my body temperature they're both steady and they're both stable now if i were to kill over and die and plop onto the floor then my body temperature would drop and drop and drop and drop and it would come into balance with the room temperature so that's equilibrium that's what happens at death is that your body comes to equilibrium with its surrounding but right now you're working really hard through things like evaporative cooling and heating mechanisms to keep this steady stable internal state which is different from the environment that's all the work you have to do to stay alive so um, that's a little kind of sidetrack into homeostasis um, the other important um, an application of water having a high specific heat just remember high specific heat is that you've got to put in a lot of energy to get an increase in temperature a lot more energy than a substance with a lower specific heat like a metal for example um, is climate control so is what you're seeing on the screen here is a map of, of the earth a Cartesian map of the earth um, and wherever you see dark colors like the dark reds down here in the sahara uh, down here in kind of parts of south america where you're seeing those very dark colors so what that means is there's a very dramatic difference between the nighttime temperature and the daytime temperature so if you go to a desert which is what you're seeing in all these places where it's very dark is that at night time the temperature is really low and at daytime the temperature is really high so the lighter the color so all these white areas that you see in the oceans primarily um, is what that means is that there's very little change of the temperature night to day so what can we what can we conclude about the characteristics of these of these areas well oceans are made of water and deserts decidedly not made of water and so is what you see is that water plays an important role in climate control wherever you have large bodies of water you get very little fluctuations in temperature and and you tend to see then a lot of life because life loves stability it loves very little fluctuation now, I'm not saying that deserts are you know completely devoid of life there's not there's a lot going on there but you see a lot more life in the oceans than you do in a desert that's for sure um, and we can also then think about what's going on um, around coasts let's look around coasts if you look around the coasts in general you're going to see place you know less red and more orangey colors wherever you've got a large body of water is what you see is is temperature control if you go to california and you go to you know to southern california you don't get much fluctuation between between the seasons in terms of temperature well you come to colorado we got 100 degrees fahrenheit during during the summer and then it's 20 degrees outside today that's an 80 degree variance in the temperature so that again is because of hydrogen bonding in water because during the daytime when the sun is beating down on the oceans that body of water rather than going up in temperature 
the water molecules are broken apart they're, they're separated by the hydrogen bonds breaking and then you get some evaporation and that contributes to, to the water cycle as well obviously now in the desert you don't have that is what you have are solid masses you, you don't have liquids you have solids sand that kind of stuff rock and they absorb heat and because they don't have any hydrogen bonding or as much hydrogen bonding as water the molecules temperatures go up the kinetic energy of those molecules goes up the temperature goes up and then when at night when the temperature drops you see the reverse happening so what is really important in climate change uh, climate control sorry not climate change um and and, and maintaining a relatively stable um global temperature now we're obviously messing around with that okay so, so what we're going to do here to finish up is is just a few questions and is, is what i'll do is I'll, I'll put the question up here um uh, i'm not going to read it out loud i'm going to put the question up here i'm going to pause briefly you can stop the video and then is what I will do is I will add the answer um, post kind of recording so you can see the answer. So here's a slide. Pause the video if you want to. I'll move on to the next one. I'll pause. Next one, pause. And then I'll add on the, uh, the answers a little bit later. Okay, so here's your first question. Okay, here comes the second one. And if you're having problems with these and don't understand why the correct answer is the correct answer, Get something going in discussions in Canvas. Here's your third question. Here's the fourth question. And here's your fifth question. Okay, so uh, just as we're finishing up here, um, this chemistry, we're gonna use this all semester long. One of the biggest uh, mistakes students make is it's hoping that the chemistry goes away and it doesn't. When we get into some thermodynamics, it's gonna come back. When we get into cellular respiration, it's gonna come back. Photosynthesis, it will come back. It's gonna keep coming back time and time and time again. So if you are struggling with this, you must come and get help now. You can come to office hours, Skype us, go to supplemental instruction, find a tutor through the uh, Learning Resource Center, go and meet with Leslie, the TA, but you've got to do something here so that you can um, get on board with the chemistry. Now, there's a lot of stuff that I'm not covering that you're going to find um, that, that's going to be kind of your book. Um, and I want to direct you again to the learning outcomes. These are going to summarize kind of what are the important things that I need to know for when these weekly tests come up. Now, you don't have a weekly test on this material until when we start week three, and that's going to cover week one and week two. Um, so. Uh, if you got the question, you know, what are the important parts, what should I study, um, go to the learning outcomes in Canvas, and I will see you soon.